Our final section for financial statements is inflation and interest rates. It should be pretty riveting. Now, what is inflation? Provided some links, as with every class below. Please go through those. So the goal, after you go through those, is that you should be able to explain inflation to someone who knows nothing about inflation. Don't use technical approaches or words. Just focus, explain it in a way that anybody could understand. You should also understand how inflation is measured and how is it measured. Well, in the United States, every country kind of has their own method of calculating it or a region. And in the United States, the primary one that's used here is called the CPI or the Consumer Price Index. Now, diving in after you've read everything below, we're going to recap some of these key lessons from inflation. So what is inflation? It's when the general price level goes up. The price of things might fluctuate, you know, up and down, but on average, are they kind of going up? And if so, by how much? So we're not talking about specific items like, oh, you see the price of gas, it went up by 10 cents since last week. Well, that doesn't mean inflation went up by that much. Gas is just one thing that you buy among all the things that you buy. So you have a basket of goods that you purchase and what happens with the general price level of that entire basket of things that you're buying. Maybe you're paying rent or there's say your home and then there's your heating bill, there's electricity, there's your phone, there's lots and lots of these different things. And we're talking with inflation, we're talking about the general basket of goods. Now, why does inflation happen? Well, I have this, this super sophisticated explanation brought to you by none other than Milton Friedman. And basically, the theory was that when you have more money than stuff, you end up with inflation. So if there's lots and lots of dollar bills that people are sending all over the place, inflation tends to go up. When people are spending that money, or money times velocity, then that tends to cause inflation. Now, what does this have to do with interest rates? Well, there's this real and nominal interest rates. Again, the links below, something to master. That You should know the difference between a nominal rate and a real interest rate. And approximately, the nominal rate minus the inflation rate is the real rate. So let's say I invest $200 at 10% and the inflation rate is 2%. What is my real inflation adjusted return? Well, the approximate answer to this is 10% minus 2%, so that's 8%. And so if I take my $200 investment, I'm getting about $16 in inflation-adjusted dollars. To get an exact answer, well, that's one. this formula that I have in the lower right-hand corner, one plus the nominal rate divided by one plus the inflation rate minus one. You'll notice that it's 7.8%. That's pretty close to 8%. So the... The approximate answer tends to overshoot it by just a little bit, in this case about 0.2%. So why does this matter for personal finance? Well, say you, you get a 10% return, fantastic. Well, we're here to tell you, no, you didn't really get a 10% return. Now, what does this mean for you? It means that a millionaire in the future isn't the same as a millionaire today. It means maybe you'll need to be a two millionaire. Now let's combine these things that we've learned before, like the rule of 72 and this concept of, of real interest. So if you have a, if you have a 2% inflation rate, how long does it take for your money to be worth half of what it's worth today? And do you remember from the rule of 72? So if you do 72 divided by two, well, that's about 36. In actuality, the answer is a little bit different from there. The rule of 72 is an approximation, but generally, you know, around 35 years, in around 35 years, everything is going to cost twice as much. So let's say you wanted to retire as a millionaire. Well, then you need to be a two millionaire in the future rather than just a one millionaire. So let's use this for real returns for how long does it take your money to double adjusted for inflation? So here's a, here's a practice problem for you. 
at an 8% return with 2% inflation, and you have a $100 investment, how long does it take to double the $100 investment in real terms? So take a moment, use the approximation method. So give it a pause. Now the answer, you have an 8% return minus 2% inflation. So the real rate is approximately 6%. How long would it take to double? Well, we don't even need to use the $100 number here. It's simply 72 divided by six. So he ends up around 12 years to double your investment. Now, if you'd only taken the 8% to double it, it would take nine years. So 12 years versus nine years, that, that's a pretty big difference in doubling your money. So the rule of 72, again, is now useful in allowing us to gauge this real rate of return and adjusting for inflation. So a little bit more on inflation. Uh, about what are normal inflation levels in most developed countries, you usually see between zero and 3%. And why do we have between zero and 3%? Because it's done on purpose. And so you may ask, well, why is it done on purpose? Well, it's, it's kind of for some complicated reasons, but zero bound and how things can get a little skiwampus and weird when things get into negative rate territory. But the kind of the main takeaway here is that the you can expect because of how central banks operate you can expect a rate of inflation somewhere between zero and three percent probably through your lifetime as long as they keep inflation under control and there are no kind of drastic events that kind of spike the inflation rate above three percent now a quick aside um you do get taxed on your gains which are actually inflation so let's say that you have a two percent rate of return but inflation is 2%. Well, in real, in real terms, you didn't make any money. There's no return there. However, the government is going to tax you on that 2% gain that you have. And in fact, this is the, the primary form that um, in most developed nations that, they, um, that wealth taxes, this is kind of a form of a wealth tax to tax a certain percentage of your net worth because as, as things inflate in value, you're going to be taxed on that inflated rate, even if it really hasn't changed in value. So since uh, most of you probably weren't alive, say, in the United States during the 1970s, you probably don't have a really good idea of what inflation is like. And so below there's an article that I like that outlines a, a period of hyperinflation. So it's, it's a month of trying to, to get by purchasing the necessities in Venezuela, and this was in 2016. And what I'd like you to do is, is to consider how do you think Fabiola could improve her situation, her then current situation in 2016? And what could she have done to better prepare for that situation? And so hyperinflation is occurring. What does that mean? It means the price of things is going up every single day by a lot say the price of things are doubling every week or every two weeks, the price is double what it was before, and prices attend are just spiraling out of control. So hopefully, as you go through that article and consider those questions, you can think through maybe what should you do if prices start going up? Because one of the purposes of assets, if you remember, is to store wealth. Now, what people start worrying about during inflation, because the value of money is going down, you don't want to be holding money. You don't want to be holding cash. You want to be holding basically anything else that stores wealth but cash. One way of thinking of this is, is people in the industry say return of capital versus return on capital. You're not worried about getting an interest rate return. You just don't want to lose the money that you have. So what do people do? Well, they focus on preservation. They buy stuff that holds value. You don't want to hold a lot of currency because it's just kind of disappearing in your hands. But however, other people tend to think the same thing. And it just creates this cycle, which can be a negative and pretty bad cycle. But there's, I don't mean to share these stories to like scare you and you become a hardcore prepper based off of an inflation story. Although if you desire to do that, I will not hold you back if that's what you want to do. But there's, there's this, there's a, there is a difference between high inflation versus hyperinflation. You know, United, the United States during the 1970s had really high inflation, 
of, say, 10%, but that's nowhere near, say, Venezuela at over a million percent, or 10 million percent, or 20 million percent, or, say, Zimbabwe in 2009. However, some of the same lessons can be learned in terms of, well, in both of those scenarios, you really don't want to be holding a lot of cash. You want to be holding something that stores wealth over time. And also, this is a, a problem that you see in a number of countries around the world, and so if you live in these different countries, you, you may be thinking in the same way. And one of the, I remember at the time, I saw examples like this, which were, um, say, during the Zimbabwe crisis with their hyperinflation, they were printing $100 trillion notes that were worth, say, 10 cents or a quarter. And there was a problem that people were using, you know, Zimbabwean dollars, the, the older ones that say, if you had, you know, a 10 Zimbabwean dollar note and it's worth literally like nothing, people would end up using it. Well, what can I use it for? And they would say, well, maybe toilet paper, but then money's not intended to be put into the sewage system. So it causes some major problems. So that is a quick inflation survival plan. Now, whether it's high inflation or hyperinflation, in a high inflation environment, you still want to focus on things to store wealth. So how are inflation and interest rates kind of related to each other? Well, they're going to stay relatively close by because if the inflation rate is 10%, and if you're going to, if you're going to allow someone, if someone's going to rent your money, if you're going to lend your money to them, you're going to demand more than 10%. You want to have more in the future than you'd get today. So when inflation rises, interest rates tend to go right along with them. And so the cost to borrow increases along with the cost of everything else in your life. So there's this, this classic joke from none other than Johnny Carson. But he said, Sci scientists have developed a powerful new weapon that destroys people but leaves buildings standing. It's called the 17% interest rate. Now, what does that mean? When an interest rate is 17%, it's hard to borrow money to buy, say, a home or to buy a building if you don't already have the money it becomes very, very difficult. And so, you know, it was the late 70s, early 80s. That's what people had to joke about. We will also review uh, business cycles briefly. Uh, br business cycles, the economy, is generally measured in this metric called gross domestic product, or the total amount of you know, goods and services produced in a country. And when it's going up, we call that an expansion, and it tends to be say, easier to find a job, uh, you tend to receive increases in, see, you tend to see increases in wages. Sometimes the economy is going sideways, so it's not growing or contracting, and sometimes it's going down or, or contracting. We call that a recession. So during a recession, you, it's more likely that you would lose your job. It is harder to find a job. And this sets kind of a backdrop to everything that you're doing within personal finance. Now, this chart below is for world gross domestic product, the entire world, but individual countries could be going up, down, or sideways within this context. So in the United States, for example, around 1991, there was a, a small recession. In the year 2000, there was also a recession. And then in 2008, there was a significant recession. And so in these three periods of time, the economy was contracting, but at other points, it's kind of gone sideways. Especially, there are a few uh, developed nations which, for the last 10 to 20 years, 25 years, that have pretty much gone sideways and haven't been either growing or contracting very much. Just kind of staying around the same gross domestic product. So this is the backdrop you need to be aware of. This isn't something that I control or that you control. But it does affect you, and you need to know the environment that you are operating under. Now, a quick aside on the opposite uh, scenario, um, known as ZERP, or Zero Interest Rate Policy. Again, there's a, there's a story below for you to go through that gives you a quick rundown of kind of what it looks like. What happens is that in, in scenarios with ZERP, is that the expected returns on investments, the expected return is low, including in theory uh, equities like stocks because of complicated things with price to earnings ratios, which tend to inflate during ZERP. And so what, what happens during this is that many investments pay less 
than the inflation rate, especially low-risk investments. So I remember in um, seeing European junk bonds that were paying something like 1.5% interest rate, but the inflation rate was 2%. And so if you were to invest, you would end up with less in the future in inflation-adjusted terms. So that's like you're, you're losing money by investing. Like what is going on? This is crazy. So in effect, these low risk investments lose money over time and say, so, well, you don't want to lose money. So what do you do? You need to take bigger risks to make any real money or even just to stay put. You have to take some significant risks with your money, which can be, can be frustrating as was highlighted in that article. So in a situation of ZERP, and sometimes ZERP can, can last for a very long time, as in Japan, if you want to retire in a situation like this, you'll, you'll likely need to save more money than, say, your parents did in order to survive on the same amount. Because, say, if you saved, let's say, a million dollars and you were getting, and you were spending, getting a 3% return or a 5% return, there's a big difference. A 5% return gives you $50,000. A 3% return gives you $30,000 on a million dollars. So that's a quick primer on ZERP. And there is a temptation with ZERP, and the temptation is if interest rates are so low, I should just borrow lots and lots of money and live it up now. Um, kind of no for two reasons. Um, first, remember how we just said you need to save more? So maybe if you're borrowing a lot of money to spend on, say, just convenience things, like right now, maybe that's not so great. Um, second, um, ZERP doesn't necessarily mean that you get to borrow money cheaply. Um, if you are a higher risk, that could still carry a pretty high interest rate. And I know many of you are young and maybe don't have any collateral and little credit history and your income's not all that high. So you might be one of those higher risk categories as well. But we'll, we'll discuss a lot more of this in liabilities and assets. But I just wanted to uh, just remind you of that. This doesn't mean a ZERP environment doesn't mean that you should just go out and just borrow a lot of money and blow it all on something that's probably not the greatest thing to be buying. Anyway, that is it for section two. Uh, dive in on that, uh, on projects, uh, continue on uh, project two and continue on project six. And then we'll dive into section three. Keep it up, you're doing great.